Hello, it is good to be here. Uh, good afternoon as we're diving into the Bible again. We have a couple of fun, interesting books this week that we're going to be yep. talking about. Almost kind of on opposite polar ends of the spectrum a little bit here. But they're um, mostly likely written by the same person. And written by the same guy. they're both wisdom literature. So. Right. So what's the, what's the plan of attack here today? We have Psalms 103 to 105, Matthew 17 to 20. Uh, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, which we talked about last week, um, Ecclesiastes one through twelve, and all of Song of Solomon chapters one through eight. So we're yeah. actually doing Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, also known as Song of Songs sometimes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as we get into these books today, you know, we're in the Old Testament again. We're into you know we're past the historical stuff. We're into kind of the poetry. And this is the last um, of the poetry. Kind of, yeah, kind of the last of the poetry. I guess the prophets are too. Well, but uh, the prophets are poetically. generally considered a separate right but. genre. But uh, yeah, so we'll, as we dig into this day, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. This is what we would call wisdom literature, and we've done a little bit with the wisdom literature so far. So like the Book of Job was wisdom literature. Proverbs. Proverbs is wisdom and literature. Psalms is. There's a few kind wisdom. Kind of yeah. considered in the category, but right. maybe not exactly. Yeah, they, it, some some of the psalms do have some of the themes. I do, of course, I'm forgetting off the top of my head. I do believe one of the psalms says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's usually like a, yeah. a tip of the hat of what kind of genre this is. Um, when we're talking about how to live, uh, how life is structured, how God has created things, um, how we live that life, then usually we get into more of the wisdom literature. Um you know, so usually what people think of as practical books are what we would kind of more point to as the, the wisdom literature in the scriptures. Yeah. And this is a life that is rightly ordered and lived before God. Um, and this is how it goes. So, you know, pr- uh, and as we get into because we'll talk about Ecclesiastes first before we get into the Psalm, Song of Songs. Um, but like I said, both of them are written by Solomon. Yeah. Probably at different points of his life. So uh, Solomon wrote Proverbs, at least a major chunk of them. Um, and from Psalm, from Psalms, from Proverbs, we hear, you know, like, if you do this, this will happen. Yep. If you live this way, this is going to be the result. If you raise your child this way, this is how they're going to be. And this is just how it is. And, and then, well, Ecclesiastes. Right. Ecclesiastes it's, goes, do you think so, huh? Everything's meaningless. Yeah. Oh, um, everything's vanity. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that as we get to Ecclesiastes here, too, why everything is vanity. But, you know, we see this lived out, right? So when we read Proverbs, it sometimes can, Proverbs can sound naive to us because you, you you see this, oh, if you do this, this will happen. Yeah. Uh, so, Pro- right, well, like, like we what? talked about with Proverbs, Proverbs is almost how the world should work. Right. But Ecclesiastes is, is the... Here's how the world is. Yeah. Because yeah. um, isn't, I, th- I saw this, I think this is how the Song of Solomon was written when Solomon was like a younger man. Proverbs is like, you know, middle age kind of gained wisdom. And now Ecclesiastes like, old he's man. an old man and he's <laughs> reflecting back on life and being like. Nothing mattered. Yeah. Which, you know, maybe you start doing it when you get a little bit older. So it kind of maybe resonates, right? You start looking back at your life and. I did a sermon on this guy. Do, did it matter? Did any yeah. of what I did matter in life? I, I was super wise, and I did all this, and now I'm dying, so it didn't matter. I lived really well. It didn't, I lived for pleasure. I did whatever my body wanted to do. You know, I had a thousand wives. Um, and did it, nothing mattered. Um, you know, and he's, he's thinking of his kingdom, right? We, I always kind of like this in the Ecclesiastes that's in there, where he'll say, you know, he's leaving all this to his son, and he doesn't know whether his son's a, a wise guy or a fool. And he's thinking of Rehoboam, who we know from his folly, breaks up the kingdom. Yeah. So Solomon's looking at his son going, oh, you're going to mess up everything I've built. And he does. Yeah, so yes. it almost feels like it doesn't matter what he built. But right. Anyway. So yeah. And, and yeah, so but, we see a little bit of that in Ecclesiastes. Yeah. And but yeah, then, well, then the last of the wisdom later, Job, is what we said was like the living out of this. Which yeah. I wondered if Job was actually written by Solomon, too. Yeah, maybe. Because there's a lot of parallels. I noticed that when reading Ecclesiastes, I was like, wait, this is almost like what it said in Job. And so you almost wonder if either Job was already written and Solomon just, you know, was familiar with it and kind of based some of it off of Job. Yeah. Or if he wrote Job or if someone was looking at Solomon's when he, you know, when Job was put together too. Right. So, yeah, yeah um, it's a possibility. I don't know. There's a lot of connection. And also, you know, the whole thing was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So it's, you know, right. there's connections anyway. He's working but he did kind of, out. It makes sense almost if Solomon wrote 
all of the wisdom literature. Yeah. But anyway, as the wise king. Yeah, as the wisest guy ever to live in Israel. Um, but, you know, there is something, uh, you know, and this is probably a good way to read our Bibles. Because, you know, these are kind of split up even though, you know, they belong together. You should read Proverbs, and then you should read Ecclesiastes, and then you should read Job, right? Because this is—it almost kind of builds up that way. Yeah. Where here's how the world should be, and this, you know, this is how God has formed it. Ecclesiastes, like, well, this is how the life is now, be under 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 the sun, where everything is meaningless without God. And then Job, we kind of see this actually played out, where Job lived Proverbs, but Ecclesiastes happens yeah. to him. Yeah, well, and his friends kind of argue from Proverbs almost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, the God's response is almost more of the Ecclesiastes. Right. And so. And everything that ties together the wisdom literature is, you know, living before God in fear, right? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Um, the first commandment, fear, the, love, and trust yeah. in God above all things. <laughs> so really, no matter where it's Proverbs, Proverbs answer to life is you should fear God and do what he commands because there's great blessing with it. And, and there, even though sometimes things don't work out as they should, many times cause and effect do take place. It, it's happened, um, right? You raise good children, generally they do tend out rather well, um, right? You kind of see the stats play out yeah. this way. Um, yeah, we're, we're, Proverbs is more working on the odds right. than, you know, the, yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, if you do this, there's like a 75% chance that things will be. Right. Um, there's exceptions to the rules, but the rule yeah. is still somewhat, I mean, the rule exists is a rule for a reason. Right. And, you know, and Ecclesiastes does this too. So Proverbs says, you should fear God, do what he says. Ecclesiastes, it'll say, everything is meaningless. It doesn't matter. So what should you do? You should still fear God and do his commandments. You know, so it doesn't, mm -hmm. it says, even if it doesn't work out, cause and effect, even if you do plan something and it just gets ruined, it doesn't mean you don't do it still. You still do it because you fear God and you want to keep his commandments. You know, so Ecclesiastes, the end result of all of it is kind of saying, you still do it anyway. Um, and then Job, you know, we see that at the end where Job is, you know, he has a life where it's well lived. He's righteous before God. And then his whole life falls apart. And what does Job do at the end? He fears God and keeps his commandments. And he's restored. And so we see that there's kind of a grace given at the end of Job. So we can kind of picture our own lives too. Um, yeah, you fear God and keep his commandments. And things might be falling apart before your eyes. People might forsake you. You, you might get hurt. You name it. But at the end of it, there's kind of this grace given, an unexpected, unmerited grace. Um, and we'll see that in the resurrection, that there will be a, a final a final grace given. It's kind of, uh, Tolkien does that kind of thinking too with the ring, how it's destroyed and everything. It, it wasn't because they succeeded in their quest, but there was a sudden grace that happened that allowed the quest to be completed um, and for good to triumph over evil. Um, yeah, so there's kind of some beauty in that too. But yeah, you had looked like you had another thought there. It was kind of... I can't remember it yeah. now. Well, if you do, <laughs> feel free. Uh, and then, you know, we'll get into the Song of Songs here too in a second. But probably let's just tackle Ecclesiastes yes. first since we kind of got into it. And, and then we'll talk about the shocking realities that's found in the Song of Songs. <laughs> so how does it begin? You know, Ecclesiastes, you sit down. What are we going to expect as we sit down and read this book from the opening lines? Everything is meaningless. Okay. Or vanity of vanities, or I think, what is the other way it's translated? Um, I can't think of the other, there's a third way it's sometimes translated, but basically everything is meaningless. Right. Yeah. Um, and this, this word is, I think, the word is said most often in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's all vanity, or which means it doesn't matter, matter in the sense of, you know, no matter what I do, it all comes to naught. Um, and here, the word, the word for vanity is the word we get for like smoke. It's hevel. Um, mm. And you get this image of if you try to reach out and grab smoke, what happens? It just goes right through your fingers. So you see something you want in life, you go at it, and it just goes right through your fingers. Or people talk all the time. It just like it felt like it was sand, and it just went right through me. Um, you know, this is what Ecclesiastes is saying, that we're trying to find meaning in life. We're trying to find, you know, um, a purpose, whatever the case may be. I'm trying to find something to find, you know, fruition in my life, accomplishment, you name it. And it seems like no matter what I do, no matter what I say, it's like trying to grab at smoke. It just goes doesn't right through matter. my fingers. It doesn't matter. Uh, so here, you know, the, 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 the thing is saying... It sounds depressing. It does sound depressing, right? Uh, it's saying that... There is, it doesn't say that there is no meaning in life, but that life seems to be meaningless. It because appears, no matter what so we the do, it just... appearance of life is meaningless. Yeah, it's 
hard to grasp. Literally, it's kind of something that's hard to kind of get at and grasp. Um, and it seems that we're unable to do it. So uh, the book here, it says, The words of the preacher, which is Solomon here, son of the David. son of David, king in Jerusalem. So this is almost like a third party that's saying, all right, I brought together today this guy. You're going to hear him speak, and he's going to tell us about life. And he's like, have at it. So it's almost like he's introducing it. And the first words are, it's, it just doesn't mean anything, right? It's almost like he's getting into it. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, there's nothing between our Bibles today because it doesn't matter, right? That's this is what we did, right? You'll see there's nothing in between our two Bibles today because we thought it's vanity, right? Yep. It doesn't matter what we put between our two Bibles. It, it just It doesn't feel like it'll accomplish anything. Right, that's kind of, that's kind of what we're getting at here. Um, so yeah, so this opening chapter here in Ecclesiastes, what do you kind of notice? What are some of the things that are uh, vain? Um, why is life vain? Well, or at least one, one thing I thought of when reading this was actually this feels like you know like chores at home where mm. you wash the dishes yeah. and they're done. And then immediately there's dishes. There's that more have dishes that need to be done. You do yeah. the laundry, and immediately there's laundry in the hamper. Yeah. I mean, my mom complains about this. Yeah. Where, you know, it's like <laughs> she finishes the dishes, and as soon, soon as she finishes you them, know. someone decides to eat something or drink something. And, and there's, there's another dish in yeah, there, right? It's, always, it's just always there. There's Every <laughs> Sunday, Dana, the sermon gets done. And there and needs a, to be another yeah. sermon written for next week. It is an unending task, right? It, and it feels like, what is the point of yeah. all of that, right? What is the point of daily life? Because, yeah, you know, it's like, because it's like, okay, I need to go home and I need to clean my bathroom. I need to vacuum. Yeah. And I had, did it last week. <laughs> got to do it again. Do it. And you're going to do it um, next week, too. <laughs> yes, I have to, you know, you get sick of, like, making supper every day. It's like, okay, right. I know I have to eat. I like eating. But I have to do it again. Right. And then it causes dishes to be made. And, yep. And, and so, the whole problem is, you know, caused and by sometimes ourselves. Sometimes it just causes you yeah. to despair. Well, that's what they say. What is it? That when you die, there's always something still in your inbox. Right. There's always something I'd love to do, right? No life will go unfinished, yeah. you should say. So, I mean, that's kind of the point of yeah. this. For, I mean, to put it in modern terms. Right. You know, the wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind. It just keeps it's going, going and going. going, going the sun, and... when it came up over here, it's going to set over there tonight, right? And it's going to we're the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just nothing changes. It all seems to kind of just keep happening. Which sometimes is a great comfort, but a lot of times it gets to us. Yeah. There, um, this is um, there's a book I have it down there. It's actually a really depressing book too, hmm. but um, it's called All Things Shining, and it's a bunch of atheists who are trying to find meaning hmm. in life. Um, there's been a lot of work from like your nihilists, and nihilists are people who believe that nothing matters, kind of like they're they're vain people. Um, and the, some of the discussions they're trying to find is how do we find joy in the daily grind? And there's been all these sorts of people who try to say, I'm just going to plug away. And I'm just going to keep doing the daily grind and grind and grind away. And a lot of them commit suicide and things like that because they realize there's no telos, there's no meaning to it, that's no matter the, what. That's the problem people find with, you know, atheism or, you know, like the evolutionary worldview is that if we're just here by random chance, you know, random processes... There is no purpose, you know, when we're dead, we're dead, we're gone, no one's going to remember us in 100 years, or right. you know, maybe 50 years, no one's going to remember so why bother, us. why right? Yeah. yeah, and that there is a, well, you know, that's kind of what the, you know, Ecclesiastes is, is getting, the, and then, you know, he does come to a conclusion of why it actually does matter. Right. Um, but yeah, like from, from the evolutionary kind of worldview, it this does fits. matter. Yeah. And so they try to find, well, a lot of what he calls vanity in here you know wisdom pleasure um what's all in here you know um knowledge wealth all this stuff it you know that's how people try to find meaning and yeah. accomplishments and not gonna find it no right you're, you're not if you find the meaning to life on this side of the grave you're gonna be very disappointed because it's it'll die with you and that's kind of the tragedy yeah. here and this is what you know solomon is getting at is if you're trying to find your meaning, if you're trying to find your identity, if you're trying to find who you are and your purpose in this life on this side of things, without Christ, without God, without hope for the future, you're in for vanity. You're in for a world of hurt. You're in for it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, well, because yeah. people try to leave their mark, you know, they think, you know, oh, they have children and grandchildren. But then, you know, maybe all of a sudden, well, we were talking about this yesterday that how... Um, family lines can actually die off because you know if there's no son to carry on the name right um we were talking about a couple you know branches of our family that's like oh that's going to be the last 
person with that yeah. name in our branch of the family because they no one else had you know they all have girls and um or people try to put their name like on buildings, you know, in Marshfield right. we have, you know, like Van de Hay Waters or right. um, Everett Rail Marshfield Public Library and eventually those buildings are going to yeah. be torn down. And replaced and, by other things, right? Yeah. It's all vain. And, you know, and there's a reason why people do that, right? There's a reason why people have their names plated, plated on things, even you know, here at church and things like that, is because in the book of Ecclesiastes, because God has put eternity into our hearts and minds. We have a desire to last forever, because God put that. That's why He created. We didn't. Yeah. We weren't created to die, right? But now, because of death and because of sin, it will die. It will die out. And the the problem is that we feel that tension in us, well, and we're saying, "I want that forever, but I can't have it." And yeah. it's well, ah. that's why death is such a tragedy. It is really. It's because we were meant to last forever, and so yeah. when that ends in death, it is a major it's tragedy because that's not how things were meant to be. Right. Death is not a natural part of our world. No. You know, the circle of life is not no, a natural it's not. thing. It is not a natural thing. That's always kind of hard to kind of get yeah. into people. Um, right? This is not natural. This is not good. God has brought victory out of it, yeah. but that's exactly it. He's brought victory out of it. This is not a good thing yeah. in and of itself. Um, and um, again, that's why everything is meaningless. I mean, that's why knowledge is meaningless because he says it increases sorrow. Right. And eventually you're going to be dead and it's not going to matter what you know. You can't pass it on anymore. Yeah. Um, Pleasures are meaningless because they're just, again, they're going to vanish or, you know, you're going to lose a wealth. You're going to lose that. Yep. You can't take it with you. Nope. Nothing um, you brought. You can bring nothing with you. Right? That, that yeah. line, is, we actually get it from Ecclesiastes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I love here because after that opening volley there, he's just saying, nothing matters. Here's why. Um, he goes back and says, here's who I am. So he goes, you know, Solomon, right? I'm, I'm king. God gave me the ability to... Uh, to apply myself and to seek everything that I wanted in life. So Solomon, he's rich, he's well off, he has no enemies, he had, you know, he he is free to do whatever he wants. Kind of like the world is Solomon's playground, and it's up to him. He's been given this mind of wisdom to try to like discover, if you will, the meaning to life. So Solomon has the ability to do this, where kind of the rest of us mm -hmm. peons can't, because I'm worried about where's my food going to come from today, you know, kind of thing. But Solomon, he has plenty of time on his hands, so he's searching after to find what's the meaning here. And like you said, no matter where he goes, he can't find it, right? So he, he applied his heart to wisdom, and he does realize it's better to have wisdom than to be a foolish person. But even what happens to the foolish person happens to the wise person. Um, it didn't matter that, guess what? I had a thousand women, and I could just enjoy pleasure and security all my days. It still brought the end result of someone who has none of those things. Um, you know, So he goes and kind of explains to us that why is everything meaningless? Death. Mm -hmm. Death destroys everything. It destroys all of our dreams, all of our accomplishments, all of the plans we have for the future. Um, it died. You know, we just had, um, uh, you know, Bob Saget just died a couple weeks ago here. And I, I saw an article that was, you know, kind of a, a good read how it mentioned, you know, Bob Saget had on his calendar what, all his oh, tours and yeah. he had plans for the entire had future. A plan to die. And uh, on it, you know, it was cut off though. So, you know, it's yeah. just death. And the can you know, it, we might have a calendar. I, I look at my, I don't have it with me now. My shot car is going off. <laughs> but uh, I have my p calendar, my planner here as a pastor, and it has all my appointments in it for months ahead of time now. Um, well, that happened to us during right. COVID where you oh, yeah. had all the Lenten services. Not nah, canceled. That was the worst I know, thing you ever. Had to, you were not happy. You had to recycle all so of I, the Lenten services. So I spent hours building those services only but, to just throw them in the recycling Yeah, because everything shut down and our yeah. plans changed rather it was, Abruptly. And I, I think I thought that too. Like, this was meaningless, right? This yeah. was vanity. So, I, you know, as I chucked them into the, the recycling bin. Well, that's what we um, have, like, the master calendar for church for the next, I mean, I think I have it set out through August now. Right. And I always, now since COVID, it's like, well, that, you know, what happens if that doesn't, doesn't happen? happen. And it's still good yeah. to have a plan. It is. But right? You can't go through life without having a plan. But it also could remember the, it, that plan could end. Yeah. What is it? Isn't there a parable or something about that? The, um, is it the rich man that... Um, well, there's that one, and, but isn't there, if the Lord wills, we'll James. do such and such. That's yeah. a James. Um, yeah, we should say, if the Lord wills, we will go to this right. town and trade and whatever. Yeah. Um, so a better thing, that's you know, a good thing to do. Like, tomorrow, if the Lord wills, I'll do this. Yeah. Um, it's, you have to keep that in mind that the plan yeah. might change, because you're not in control of the plan. Right. So, it's interesting, and we see this here, you know, Solomon's wrestling with this, and this is a good thing. Um... 
this is, you know, talk about a really realistic book. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, I know you've mentioned this about Ecclesiastes too. It's actually a really good book. Yeah, um, I like Ecclesiastes. actually might be my favorite book of the Old yeah, Testament. Because it's honest. Well, and it seems depressing, but in a lot of ways it's actually very encouraging. Because in some ways it's a comfort to think that, okay, you know, it's good to enjoy life. But if certain things don't happen, it's not that okay. big of a deal. If I don't become rich or famous, it's not a big deal. If I, you know, if I don't do this or that, it doesn't really matter. Right. Um, as long as, you know, you're living a somewhat decent life. Yeah. It, it kind of takes the pressure off. It does. And it, it's, it's freeing, quite yeah. honestly. Um, you're and free the to truth do, does that. Yeah, you're free to do stuff because it's good to do, not just, yeah. 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 And, you know, that's kind of, a, a, I think, a blessing in this book and a strength of it um, is that it makes us sit back and actually critique our life, yeah. you know, and... To sit down and, and not that I sit there like, oh, nothing that means anything. It doesn't matter. Um, but to actually be honest with ourselves and put it in perspective. Yeah. Um, that it's okay. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, there's something bigger than me going on It's not on the here. end of the world. I'm not the, this book is kind of a good way for us to realize we're not the center of the universe. Yeah. God is, which is where the book kind of concludes with. Um, but yeah, you know, so it kind of sets it up. So I hear Solomon say, it was vain to live wisely. It was vain to live, you know, and go to a work ethic. It didn't matter that I had a good work ethic because, right, it still, yeah. it still died. Um, and I love, you know, this is another point here, chapter 2, verse 24. There is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This is from the hand of God. So kind of like one of the purposes is enjoy your work. Yeah. Honestly, the thing that God has given you to do have that, enjoy it, because that's enjoy what God... Enjoy your work and enjoy your yeah. free time, your pleasure. Yeah, enjoy the food you eat, the drinks you have, the, the time you do have. Uh, so really, the whatever, you know, I'm 30 years old, God grant it, Lord wills it, I'll live another 30, right? Whatever days he gives me, I will live them in thankfulness every single day, um, because he's given me this it's, day. Yeah, it's sort of a do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. That's kind of the point that's getting at here, too. You know, well, Jesus kind of summarizes is, it. Well, and this is... Maybe a good thing. This is a good book for young people to read too, because this is kind of the wisdom of an older person, you know, someone who's yeah. lived long, and it's like here's the point of you this. know to you know someone who's like in high school or something who's preparing to go to college and their job and you know get right. married, and it's like there's a lot of pressure to that, mm -hmm. you know, the whole choose the right career, choose the right job, and choose the right spouse, and it's you know this yeah. maybe this is good. Don't freak out. Yeah, because whatever God gives you. Take yeah. it, take it, and go. And just be, which is very difficult to do to just it be is. happy with what you've been given. But it is good to remind, have the reminder. Right. Um, it's also a good reminder because this isn't think of. I was thinking of with the you know wealth is vanity, where a lot of people you know there's the whole like first world problems yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. and you know people are like, well, what do you have to worry about or be depressed about or whatever? You know, you have all this stuff, and it's like that's it's meaningless. I mean, wealth right. is meaningless, and right. you don't have. That doesn't well, make you happy. That makes it almost worse because because we have those things, and then it can be more upsetting when yeah, also we least. realize it's like oh that doesn't matter, right? It it can be more unnerving. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. If you have nothing, in some ways, you're actually more in a way better off. Yeah. You enjoy what you do have. Yeah, yeah. you're more appreciative what what little you do have than when you have yeah. a lot. It's a lot harder. It's kind of like the, you know the the Great Depression. You know, we don't have many of those people left around anymore, but. When I was a younger kid, I always would hear some of them talk. Yeah. You know, they didn't have anything, but what they did have, they enjoyed. Right? You, you kind of, you, they you always were, kept things. You were excited to get an orange music. for Christmas. Right. Um, and we see that, you know, they do enjoy what they have. Just because you get more stuff, there's almost more anxiety, which is what yeah. he says in here, right? The more stuff you get, the more worried you're going to be. Yeah. Which I think um, our generation and the younger generations are starting to understand a little bit more. because I grant it. I think because there's that, the whole, like, tiny house movement and, like, wanting fewer possessions. Right. And, um, like, mm. I see, like, you know, I've seen a few cases where, you know, people, like, parents have died or something, and then they have to clean out their house, and it's and the kids don't want so it. much yep. stuff. And um, I've now seen people who are getting to that, and they're like, I need to start downsizing, because right. I just have too much stuff, and it's meaningless. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I try to always keep that in mind, to not collect so much stuff. Which is a good thing, because you have to get rid of it at some point. Yeah, so. someday I'm going to die, and either I'm, so either I'm getting rid of it when or I have to downsize into an apartment or a nursing home, or, you know, someone yeah. else is going to have to clean up my house someday. That's good, right? So. And a good thing for our materialistic consumer culture, um, that the goal, the goal of life is not just to buy more stuff and yeah. have more stuff, just to keep a, an economy going. 
Um, a good thing to keep in mind for us too. So chapter three, I love it. Has that you know the time. This is always famous. I see this a lot for funeral texts. You know, there's time a time for everything. For everything. I love this passage too. Uh, to be born, to die, to plant, to pluck up, to kill, to heal, to break down, to build up. You know, this. I, mean, I always love this kind of thought because you're sitting there like, okay, there is a time for everything, but how do I know what time it is? Right? You got to ask yourself that question, which the book then answers with: You need wisdom. You need the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Because uh, the fearing God, knowing who God is and what he does, um, is going to help you know what time it is. It's going to help you to say, no, it, it's the time to tear down right now. It's the time to get rid of stuff. It's the time to collect stuff. You know, it, it, The wisdom of the Lord tells us this stuff. Um, so it's a practical application of God's wisdom. So, yeah, a famous, you know, very famous, well-known chapter. Um, yeah, good. What, what else? Anything that you see here before I kind of... Press on on the other stuff. Probably should keep pressing on. All right, because I know we we're, have to get to Song of Solomon. We do. Too. I know we never have enough time for this no. stuff. The <laughs> chapter, you know, kind of skipping ahead a little bit here. Um, you know, there's the what happens to man, what happens to beast at the end of chapter three. So he's going again on uh, we all die. Yeah. Um, this is why it's kind of hard, you know, to get meaning. Um, chapter four begins with the, you know the everything under the sun. And you have this phrase a lot in Ecclesiastes. Everything that's done under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, there's nothing that, you know, changes. It's all the same. You know, the, we have this, the saying, right? The more things change, the more, the more they, they stay the same. same. Um, yeah, that's kind of another point here. Yeah, it, that it, everything just keeps happening. There's nothing new under the sun. Right. Which I love, because I think in the lectionary, this text is actually paired up with something in the book of Acts. I think when it's the philosophers who are on the hill, oh. and... They always, they're, they're sitting on the hill all day because they want to hear something new. new. And then when Paul does come to bring about the new, he comes to talk about Jesus and the resurrection, which is the only new thing that's ever happened. Um, they sit there and scoff at him. So it's kind of interesting, you know, they, they, they desire to hear a new thing. They hear it and they reject it yeah. um, because they're used to the meaninglessness of this. Yeah. Uh, so if I remember correctly in our lectionary, those are paired up okay, together. Okay, that would make sense. Um, and yeah, I just kind of like that. It is kind of like, you know, people have this idea of like, you know, the march of time, we're making progress right. and, you know, we're better than the people before. I said, mm. really, history just has a tendency to cycle around. I mean, even with some of the cultural stuff we're dealing with, I mean, some of that is what Rome was dealing oh, with, yeah. you know, stuff you can find about Rome and it's just, it's, you've, it, there is nothing new because right. everything, it may look slightly different and be in a slightly different form, but they really... Yeah. Anything different. Well, you know, I had two experiences with that this this past weekend where I was talking to someone last week about, you know, annual reports. You go over and look at Pastor Bragg, he's like annual reports here, right? From like the sixties. And you're sitting there and you're like, Did he write this last month? Yeah, um, there's I have several quotes. That, I should have the same pull thing. those out. Right. Because, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's the children don't go to Sunday school after the Christmas program and yeah. we have the same question we have every year is how do you keep families here we are sixty years later. going and you know, because they go Sunday school is really busy in the first four months, and then it's not in spring, and it's like, that's nothing new. Oh, right. People not coming to communion, people not giving, you know. Right. It's, All the same problem. Yeah. And here we are yet, 60 years later, the Lord's kept it going. Yeah. Even some um, of the cultural stuff he mentions in some of those reports, it's like, yeah. whoa, well, okay. And then even going back further, Martin Luther, right? He's writing in the large catechism, just sitting there thinking about yesterday, and he's sitting there saying, Pastors don't teach this. They don't know it. The parishioners don't know it. Their kids don't know it. And you're just like, Luther, uh, did you just write this well, last week or something? They, and, yeah, what is it? They think they can. we have many books and they can learn it from yeah. there or something. And people are always like, oh, you can just Google it. Right. It's the same thinking. Luther back in his day said, oh, we have books. You can just book it. You know, in yeah. our day, we well, can just Google it. And yeah. so it's the same thing. Same thing. Um, people's nature, even if our technology has changed, the nature yeah. of us who use the yeah. technology has not changed. Um, so we, well, we and the severity of the issues maybe fluctuates, but the right. issues are the same. Right. It's nothing new. Yeah. Um, the only new thing is the new age that Jesus is bringing through the resurrection, right? Uh, which is kind of, it leans a little bit towards the back of the book here, too. Um, but yeah, so, you know, chapter 5, I always remember this one being at the seminary doors. Chapter 5, verse 1, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know what they are, that they are doing evil. Um, don't be rash with your mouth, all that good stuff. So, um, you know, he's giving here practical applications for this, you know, noting, you know, um, even though everything happens at the end, it's still better to live this way than to be a yeah. fool. Um, especially when it comes to living before God, which, you know, 
is a thing we shouldn't be foolish with. Well, because again, you're thinking, we have to think of eternity, not right now. That maybe is kind of another point you can get away from this book is that you should be thinking about almost what happens after you die yeah. than what's here now. And that's why you should live well now right. because you're thinking of eternity, yeah. not... Right, we, we can be... The pro our problem is that we don't have goals that are too big. Our goals are too small, right? Because we think, oh, 10, 15, 40 years from now, but we're not thinking eternity from now. Yeah. Um, that well, is the goal. We see that with parents with their kids a lot where it's like, well, I want them to, you know become, you know, an NFL star or something or get into a good school or whatever, but they then they neglect the, like, bringing them to church because right. they're, you know, they they prioritize sports over church because it's like, well, they need to, you know, sports will get them somewhere in life when they forget that going to church will get them even farther right. looking past right. everything because, you know, someday they're going to, even if they get into the NFL, someday they won't be in the NFL right. anymore. There's a, there's a goal. There's a, you know, the, and theology and in Christianity is called a telos. It means you have a, there's a, there's the goal right there and we have to get there. And so what's the path we need to take that gets us there? Um, to run the race. Right. Yeah. And this is why Jesus says it is finished, right? He, he's, he says, telos, or telos tastai. Um, it means I've accomplished, right? It's been achieved. I've gotten the goal. Um, and same thing with us as Christians, right? We're pursuing after the goal that Jesus has given to us. Um, yeah. So it's good stuff. And Ecclesiastes is hitting all these buttons as well. Uh, what else here do you see? Anything that's kind of keeping up here? Uh, do, 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 do. I have to remember what order this all goes in. <laughs> yeah. You know, skipping ahead, I, you know, chapter 8. Um, keep the king's command because God's oath is with him. Uh, don't be hasty to go out from his presence. Don't take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps the command will know no evil thing. And the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. So once again, you know, the, the time, there's a time for everything. We hear a wise heart knows how to interpret things. Um, and here we have the, the, the words of the king, which if you understand who Solomon is, right? He is the son of David. Um, was, this is kind of like a proto-Jesus kind of thing. This is a prototype for Jesus. Um, and it's a reminder that you know, who our king is the Lord Jesus, right? And so we follow whatever his word, his word is supreme in our so it's life. It's like going back to Job again. The, right. you know, God's answer to Job was, I'm God. I'm God, so, <laughs> yeah. You're going to live with that, Job? Right, it's kind of the same thing here. You're going to be able to live with again, that. Again, there's a lot of connections to Ecclesiastes and Job. Yeah, um, yeah, there are. Um, you know, the back half of chapter 8 talks about those who fear God are going to do well with life. Um, th there's, of course, the... Back also at the end of chapter 8 by saying a man cannot know God's ways. Um, and so this is a reminder that God has to reveal his way. And this is why Christianity in the early church was called the way. Um, this is why Jesus says, I am the way, right? We don't know the way to the Father. And Jesus is like, oh, of course you do. I am the way. And, and so this is a, you know, talk about how we see Jesus even here in Ecclesiastes. It's a reminder for us that our Lord has revealed to us the way to go, to get to Him, to have a life that is meaningful because it's a life that's connected to Him. Well, it's um, like the last few chapters are almost kind of pointing that direction of, okay, everything's meaningless, so how should you think right. of life? Because, you know, in uh, chapter 9, verse 7, you know, go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine and with a merry heart, for mm. God has already approved what you do. Enjoy yeah. life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he is giving you <laughs> under the sun, because that is your portion in life. Yeah, um, yeah. whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, uh, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to right. which you are going. So basically, you know, do the work now, because it's not going to matter later, but do yeah. it now. Do it now. Get it done. Um, and that's a good reminder, too, um, that the point I was going to hit there, that Life has been ordered by God. You know, there's a lot, you know, from our end of things, we like to see that I'm doing this, I'm accomplishing this, I'm building this empire and things like that. But really, on the opposite thing, opposite, this is God doing, He's giving us the portion he of like, whatever He, he gives. He like sets the parameters that we work within. Almost. Yes. And, you know, whatever God decides He's going to bless you with or give, He's just going to give you. Um, and it, our contentment is found in just saying, This is what He's given to me, I'll enjoy this. Whatever that might be. This is the path that I've been set on, so I might as well enjoy the path and not covet someone else's path. Yeah, and that's and which is both the challenge, but it's also the blessing. That's 
This is what he's given to me. Thanks be to God. That should be enough, uh, whatever he gives. Um, yeah, there's the, I love chapter 12 here, kind of skipping so we can get to Song of Songs here. Yeah. But uh, I love the, remember your creator in your youth. So you would mentioned the beginning, this is a good book for like a young, this is kind of yeah. an old person to a young person here. Um, and here we say that it's good to remember your creator now, in the days of when you're young. Um, before the evil days come and your years draw near, in which you will say, I had no pleasure in them. I, you know, you, you talk, you know, older people, I've talked to older people all the time and they just are saying, I'm done. Yeah. I just, I'm done. Right. They don't have any pleasure. All the people that they remember in their life are gone. Um, you know, the, they, they physically can't do the things yeah. that they, they want to do anymore. Yeah, I've seen that with a lot of older people where they, yeah, they almost lose the will just because it's like, well, you know, I used to be able to do this. I used to be able to do that and I can't do it and people have to do it for me. And yep. uh, yeah. yeah. And so it's good to remember our creator now and, and these days, you know, you and I were both young. Yeah. Right? Life starts weighing you down as you get older more and more and it is harder to enjoy working right. and yeah. talking about theology. Even. Exactly. <laughs> right. And the day may come where I won't be able to read scripture anymore because I can't yeah. see it anymore. Right? That would be a horrible day. Um, I'll have to have someone to read it yeah. to me. But um, yeah, hopefully younger it, person. Get it into your mind but while you can so that when you're older and can't read and can't hear. and Yeah. It's, so it's there. So you're lying in your hospital bed or nursing home. And... Yep. And so at the end of the book, um, it, the book ends with the preacher, which is Solomon, kind of saying, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. You know, that's kind of his last word. And then the person who introduced him kind of comes back. So it's kind of a narrator here. Um, and he comes back in in chapter 12, verse 9. Um, and it kind of says, you know, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote, wrote words of truth. Uh, the words of the wise are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. Um, and so this is someone, yeah, you know, this is given by the shepherd. Um, you know, my son, beware of anything beyond these. So it's almost like a narrator, like a third person here, like talking to his son. And he's like, here's what Solomon has said. So Solomon kind of yeah. comes to the room, teaches the son, and then he leaves. And then the guy's like, see, um, it's kind of like lesson learned almost. Um, and then finally, at the end of it all, of, you know, of the making of books, there is no end. You can see all my books <laughs> behind me here. Um, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. So when you say, I just am in a reading slump right now yeah. and can't do this right, there's a much weariness in study. Yeah. Um, and then finally, you know, the, whoever the, the narrator, the this is the end. He's looking at his son saying, this is the point well, this of this is... whole book. All right? Everything's been heard. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Yep. That's um, the whole duty of man. Yeah, for God will bring every deed into judgment and with every secret thing, whether good or evil. All right? So God's going to work it out in his own time. Um, well, it's kind of reminded of Judgment Day is coming. Right. So you might as well fear God and keep his commandments because, yeah, yeah, you want Judgment Day to go well. So even if life is vain, it doesn't matter because Judgment Day is coming when God yeah. will bring out meaning and we will see how everything has been arranged. Yeah. So, good. Well, that's the, the book of Ecclesiastes yeah. in a nutshell. There's always more to say, yes. but we'll press on forward with the Song of Solomon, the <laughs> Song of Songs here. Um, and of course, this is, you know, we did a Bible study on the Song of Songs a couple years ago, 2019, right before everything kind of shut down, um, in 2020 there too. And, uh, a hard book. Why do you think? Obvious reasons, of well, course, but. Yeah, it's one of those that it's almost an awkward topic in a way. Well, uh, right. Because, well, especially our culture doesn't. It's like we're saturated with, you know, sex, but at the same time, we can't talk about it almost. Right. Um, isn't there something, I thought I heard once that um, Hebrew boys weren't allowed to read this until they were like 30 yeah. or something. Yeah, there's some books that Hebrews you couldn't read until a certain age. And yeah. Like uh, Ezekiel, you couldn't read that until you were 30. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, yeah. so yeah, we find this almost awkward because I think there's this idea of Christians as being like prunes and... Right, right. Um, you don't talk about these things. Yes. You know, there's the whole purity yeah. ring yeah. culture and all that stuff. And here's, you know, basically a love letter. It is. And it's, yeah. You're right. kind of like reading in on someone else's love letter almost is what it feels like. Right. Which can be, it can feel kind of awkward, yeah. right? Um, yeah, it's almost like, yeah, like you said, you found like a love letter. And like, what's this? And you're like, yeah. oh, this is kind of embarrassing, right? Uh, 
and but for us you know we get this purview and you know it is it is kind of awkward at times reading it the language can make you blush because it is a love letter um this is most likely solomon again and this is like a love poetry written to his bride um who is called the shulamite which is the female version of the name solomon so you kind of got you know this idea of one flesh so she is him you know I mean, this is the idea of marriage here um, we're not sure. There's a lot of thoughts of exactly who is this. Some may think this is the Egyptian princess that Solomon marries. Some think that's her. Um, there's a lot of thoughts out here. There's some who even say that this isn't Solomon in the poem, and this is you know this uh, you know poetry that's based on Solomon's life or something like that. Um, but yeah, you do have you know the kind of awkwardness, but it's also beautiful, right? Yeah. God created marriage. He created love. He created intimacy. We see it plenty represented in Hollywood in our media, uh, in our schools, where, you know, on the, the shelves of uh, the checkout uh, uh, lanes. Um, so why shouldn't the church talk about it? Why shouldn't the church have it in it, right? And this is a proper understanding, right? This yeah. is how intimacy can be expressed. There's the joy in the marriage here. Uh, there's the joy of the union in marriage. Um, and it's also gorgeous. And, you know, it's, it's, we see the, you know, the desire for it here too. Um, ultimately, this book, you know, while it does point to marriage and, and love, there is also something that's greater here going on. We see, of course, whenever marriage is brought up in the Bible, it always then points us ahead to Jesus. Christ in the church. Yeah, what He's Jesus inside. and his bride. And so it's this beautiful imagery because in this book, you'll read it and there's actually different characters in the yeah. book. There is the, there's her, the, the bride, the beloved. Um, there is him, right, the, the belover, right, the guy, the, the man here. And there's also like others, so there's kind of like almost like, like a choir, or... which you kind of get this in a little bit of Shakespeare stuff. You get like the different lines, and then there's like the narrator and the a angels or whatever, you know, yeah. off to the side. That's what's kind of going on here. There's kind of a um, uh, witnesses so, watching yeah, this. Yeah, it's almost like you know when a couple's getting married, you have you know the wedding party that's yeah. standing around. It's always I, I kind know. of picture this. No, that's that's actually probably a really good thought yeah. here. It's the witnesses to the wedding here who yeah. are watching the. The love unfold, you could say. Yeah. Um, and there's actually, uh, there's several scenes here. Um, and there's almost like a cycle in this book. And so it's kind of like there's searching. It begins kind of usually like all of a sudden there's someone, she, it's usually the her. She's looking for her beloved. She's, she's missing him. Where is he? I got to go searching for him. I want to find him. Um, and then there's this kind of like they do find each other. And there is the, you know, kind of the romantic, the wooing. And everything, and then there's the wedding, typically that's mentioned, and then the consummation. And just as they're going to the act of consummation, the scene cuts, and then it goes with her once again, like on the prowl, looking for her beloved again. And you're like, what in the world just happened? And it's kind of Solomon's way of saying that love never, human love especially, never fully satisfies. If that makes sense, yeah. there's always a continual longing. There's always a continual searching. There's always a continual discovery. Um, that's happening in love. And, uh, you know, Solomon's kind of pointing this out and, and bringing it out for readers. And when you read it, like, oh, yeah, yeah, that kind of makes sense. There's always that, and you can think like, even like high school and things like that, when you have crushes, there's always like this searching and this longing. And, um, and even when you do kind of have like a, a moment that's like, oh, that was so uh, fulfilling, there's still kind of like a, oh, yeah, I just, yeah. I want more. And there's a, a desire for more there too. Is it kind of like when, Couples actually do get married. There's the honeymoon period, and then all right. of a sudden it's like, eh. and you might rekindle that yeah, once in a while. But right, so it's like a wound that you. keeps happening here, um, and that's actually kind of how this because it's kind of weird because this keeps happening. This uh, searching, finding, and just as about to consummate, it kind of ends, and then they're find, searching again. The book ends with them like they just they found each other, and then it ends with them on the search for each other again, um, and then also because this kind of falls under wisdom literature again. There's often a scene of this being um, the woman is wisdom and she's searching mm -hmm. after her beloved, which is us. Um, so she's coming to search for us. So you can see wisdom being Christ. Christ comes to search for us. He's looking for his lost sheep. He's looking for his lost coin. Uh, and when he finds it, there's a great joy. And there's a party, which usually looks like a wedding feast. And, you know, so you, you get all this kind of imagery that's going on here, too. Um, so yeah. The one we talk about, like, this represents Jesus and the church. Jesus might actually be the woman, not the, the bride woman, in this case. Because, yeah. because of the wisdom and the feminine. Yeah. Being, you know, kind of the, yeah. God's person, God's personified here. Mm. 
Um, so there's a little bit of that here. There is, a, I think it's chapter five here, um, where there's a woman who is searching for her beloved, and there's guards who stop and yeah. ask her. Um, there are, you know, and there's one situation where they kind of rough her up. Um, but then she actually finds her beloved, and I think it's in a garden um, scene. And this actually reads very similar to Mary finding Jesus in the garden um, after the resurrection oh, when yeah. uh, she sees the angels. And they literally say the same thing. The guards tell this woman here, who are you looking for? And the angels look at her and say, who are you looking for? Uh, so there's kind of like the Song of Songs is actually kind of pulling in the Gospels here a lot. It's, you know, we, we think, oh, Song of Songs, we don't talk about this. But the Bible actually alludes to it a lot, especially in the Gospels, um, especially in the Gospel of John, I've kind of discovered. Um, and in our hymnody, too, we have the, a lot of imagery from the Song of Songs that's used in our hymnody, too. But, um, yeah, so there's a lot going on underneath the text here, too, that's being used elsewhere in Scripture. Um, but, yeah, usually do, people do kind of get a little, you know, unsettled by some of the language in here because there are very, you know, very blushing descriptions. Um, but we see how this is the delight of her husband and her bride and the bride and her husband um, and we see this with Jesus, right? We have a delight in him, right? He's our savior. He's our Lord. He is for us. He will never abandon us. So there's a, a delight in who he is. And just as Jesus, Jesus delights in his bride, right? He delights in us. Um, he loves us. Um, he gave himself for us. Uh, so we see this here in this kind of poetry. Um, yeah, anything stick out to you as you kind of glance through Song of Songs or anything? I have difficulty with poetry. <laughs> yeah. What about it? Because it is difficult. I, I, don't know, I, is. I always, because I, I have difficulty with like Shakespeare and stuff, you know, speaking of that, you know, where it, I can never get my brain quite around what people are actually saying when it gets very poetical. Yeah. Um, um, I just don't think like that, apparently. No, that's, no, I, that's to, I totally get it. Because kind of, you do get lost yeah. in something. That's what you do here. get a little bit, and it's like, wait, what in the, you know. Yeah. Um, one of the things that does hit me in this book, too, um, is very often we're told, kind of on a refrain, like in chapter 2, verse 7, um, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gals of the does of the field, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. So love here is also characterized as something that's dangerous. You don't just play around with love. Very often we find out it can cause a lot of painful situations. Um, and so love here is pres presented as something you respect and you honor, um, that you don't just wholesale. It can become dangerous. You know, I, uh, you know, I mentioned it before in a couple of different situations where it can lead you to hurt yourself, but also others too. Like love can become corrupted. Um, it, can, it can turn into a kind of like a stalker kind of mentality. Or uh, lust. Or, or lust. Yeah, you start using it for the wrong purpose. And, and oftentimes, and it does it later in the book here, in Song of, Solom Song of Solomon here, but he'll talk about how love is kind of like a burning oven. And if you're not careful, that love will burn out of control, right? It belongs properly you know, I've seen in, this marriage. in a marriage, in a hearth, right? Mm -hmm. Where it can burn properly and actually give warmth and right, healing that, and food. Yeah, so yeah, the idea is fire good or bad. Right. It depends on the situation. Like, I had a campfire last night in the campfire ring. Right. It was a lot of fun. We cooked some steak and hot dogs and potatoes over it Ooh. and um, it was a perfect day for it. But, yeah. you know, there was also um, a couple, I think there was a couple house fires and a right. car fire in Marshfield in the last week. You killed um, somebody. Yeah. yeah. And so, in that case, it's out of control. It's a bad yeah. thing. You um, just light, light a fire right here and start cooking food, right? It's know, spread out of control. You know, the whole, you know, a small campfire can also turn into a wildfire that right. burns thousands of acres. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the illustration of love where, you know, if, yeah, if it's kept in its proper form and respected, like, you know, in marriage, um, it, it's a good thing. If you do it outside of marriage, you know, hookup culture, living together before marriage, um, all of that stuff, it's, it does harm you. Right. Yeah. So it's always good to be careful with it. I'm trying to find here if there's something else that's sticking out. Um, <laughs> I like how the the um, the beloved the woman is um, like don't look at me I'm like she's kind of like I'm ugly or something and the right. man's like you're beautiful and says that several yeah. times and yeah you know and you find that in love too there's always a comfort there is a rejoicing right the woman she doesn't see much in herself but her husband does the one who loves yeah. her does um, and you see that with Christ right we look we can look at ourselves and say. Yeah, I, I'm not really much to look at, right? I carry these sins and these scars and these stains on my life. Um, 
but that the Lord looks at us and comforts us with his words of consolation, of love, of peace, that he is for us, and that nothing, like, for him, right, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, and in his eyes, right, we are his beloved, right, you are his beloved, um, and so in that case, Jesus sweet. is the man in this, so it's Jesus yeah. kind of both, yeah, why not, of, why not, <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, yeah, and of course, all these scriptures testify yeah. to him. So he can he can take up whatever part of the line he wants. That's his book. Um, we just get to read it. So yeah, um, yeah, you do see that there's often a uh, you know I am uh, hardened. I am not you know beauty or graceful, and he sees her as beautiful. And oftentimes in this book too, you see her being clothed by him. Like she you know, she gets the richest dresses and you know the beautiful garments because he is. You know, he's clothing her. Well, that's like baptismal language, almost the, you know, we're clothed in his righteousness, so yeah. the whole yeah. white garment, um, yeah. Right. The wedding feast where the guests are given garments. Right. Yeah, it was Matthew 22, I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, or 23. One of those um, parables. Yeah, and you, so you have that there, and I also love, um, there is... Uh, Revelation. Revelation picks up a lot of this wedding imagery here and a lot of the, the, the language even um, of the bride adorned for her husband, dressed with beautiful garments, you know, arrayed with the jewels and everything. Um, but this is the description of the church. Uh, so we see a lot, you know, a lot of this language is used of marriage of this woman here is used of the church later on too. And there's something to be said then for, you know, people always wonder why the church makes such a big deal out of marriage and marriage, you know, the proper understanding of marriage you know like our culture is trying to mess up the idea of marriage and it is because people are well it's not a big deal it's like a secondary thing you right. know it's all we need to know is about jesus died and you know but that is it's all tied up in that marriage I mean, the marriage language i mean marriage is big in the scriptures i mean obviously there's a whole book it's, about it i would say it's probably the most predominant theme yeah. in the entire scriptures and that's actually probably why marriage does get attacked so much mm -hmm. Out in the culture, because, I mean, the devil knows that's where, you know... find the gospel. Yeah, the gospel is found in marriage. I mean, you know, fathers and marriage are kind of usually the two, and, you know, if you, mess, you have a bad relationship with your father, you, you know, the heavenly father, you probably right. have bad, you know, views of that then. Um, and if you mess up marriage, you know, divorce, cohabitating, you know, if you start saying that marriage can be four people, five people, whatever, people right. with their pets, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, me and my tree. There was, yeah. yeah, there was someone with a tree. Yeah. Um, and it's, you start screwing that up and that gospel message gets yep. lost. It does. Yeah, because it also becomes whatever I want to make yeah, it. Yeah, instead of now marriage. Now the Lord has made it. Yeah, instead of marriage pointing to the gospel, it now is just. Right. It means nothing. You know, and I'll tell a lot of people, and I think that's a struggle, because it's part of our sinful flesh, but, you know, I'll tell a lot of the, the couples I sit down and talk to, and it's general good marriage thoughts and advice is that you know marriage is like the, the the circle hole and we're like the square peg that we're trying to fit into it and the goal is that we try to change marriage so we can you know fit it in yeah. but it should be the opposite way around we need to trim us off and change us so that we're fitting in the design yeah. for marriage which is always hard um because we like we like to try and make it easy and have if, it my way if this is the way it is maybe it's better we don't marry <laughs> all right that <laughs> Matthew chapter 19, right? The disciples, they're sitting as Jesus is lambasting the Pharisees for how they don't understand page one of the Bible, right? And all of a sudden the disciples are sitting there like, I, uh, Jesus, if that's true about marriage, then it's better not to marry. And Jesus is kind of like, that's a thought, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, if, if you can't live according to what God has designed in marriage, it would, be, it would be better not to marry. Um, but if not, you know, Paul was saying, if you can't calm down the lust and the intentions, then you have to learn to how to apply it correctly. Yeah. Um, if you're going to enter into marriage, that's the institution you're going to enter into, yeah. and you must live that way. Well, that reminds me of a, of a chapter in the book Ladylike, which is in the church library. It's a good read. Um, but they have several essays about different topics with, you know, basically what it means to be a woman. And one of them is on the, um, the whole submitting to your husband question. Mm. And their point in there is kind of, you choose your husband, you choose to get married, and so you're choosing to enter into that state of submitting to your mm. husband um, is kind of the point in there. It's, you know, you submit to all these, you know, you submit to your doctor, your parents, your teachers, but your husband is someone you said, I do to, you chose to enter right. the state, and so this is what the state of marriage requires is that you submit to your husband. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of the same right. thing where it's, yeah, you want to 
enter into the state of marriage, you should accept what marriage is, not try to change what it is. Right. Don't change the parameters. Exactly. Because otherwise, when you change the parameters, you change what marriage is. Yeah. And it no longer is marriage. It's something else, right? When you yeah. get into the debates, like the homosexuality debate, it's changing marriage, yeah. what it is, like why God made it to begin with. Yeah, our culture's um, changed it into, oh, two people who love each other. Right. And that, it's like, that is that's far from it. That's not what marriage is, was instituted as by right. God. In fact, if you're not a husband and wife yet, right, you actually don't love each other yet. Because not until you exist as a husband and as a wife can you love each other. Yeah. So really, marriage is the foundation for your love, not love for marriage. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we get that backed up because we're so full of lust and uh, our passions well, we, and desires. We that, mistake lust for love. Right. Yeah, that's true, too. Um, and not a submission of giving of myself. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, we see that all the time. And here, the Song of Solomon is giving us a proper understanding of what that looks yeah. like. And... The true joy that's found in there, too. Because just as much as there's a cross when it comes to marriage, and that's because when you put two sinful people together, that's what happens. You right? multiply the sins. Right. Um, it actually, you know, marriage is also a blessing and gift given by God. But yeah, I always uh, tell people, right, when you put two sins in cross proximity, it actually makes the sin worse. Um, so I'll tell them, you know, if you have a problem right now, it's going to be like tenfold after you get yeah. married. Because that's just the nature of the problem. It'll be yeah, worse. Yeah, there's something you don't like about your future husband um you don't expect marriage to change it no it just won't and like i said there'll be stuff that you'll get crucified and you can work on it so you can get better but if there's something that bugs you it's gonna it's not just yeah. gonna bug you later on it's gonna get it's gonna annoy you to the fact that you can't stand it yeah um yeah so it's just always one of those things so it's always good marriage advice um you know don't just assume oh well, the day i get married it's gonna be like this magic spell falls over us and it, you know things mm. get better in fact because the devil hates marriage and so does our sinful flesh and our world we can expect life to get harder after marriage yeah. uh, that's why paul will say i wish i wish all of you would be like i am because i'd wish to spare you from worldly trouble <laughs> yeah and <laughs> there's a part to that um about marriage but here we see it being used properly and good blessing um, and what it does result in. And this is what we want marriage to result in, too. This is why it takes a lot of effort and sacrifice to make this look like this. That's why Jesus died for us. Um, yeah, so I do love, you know, as we kind of come to the end of the book here, because, you know, you can stop and talk about all the different poetry. There, All the lines kind of you know, talk about the, all the, the forest among the, tr the trees in the forest here. Um, there's so much in all these little lines that play out other places in Scripture or have a deeper meaning. Um, or, you know, our metaphors that we can use to say, like, what in the world are they describing here? Um, which we cannot get into all that right which now. Which we cannot. You know, this would, so, we took a 10-week class on this. I bet the um, Thy Strong Word on KFUO has probably done Song of Solomon. I think they've done every single book. So have if they? you're interested, they you go chapter by chapter, verse mm, by verse, stuff. kind of. Um, so if you're that research, we can't get into it here. Right. Um, There's other places are, that can. Yeah. I love how, um, you know, the end of the book kind of gives some final thoughts on love itself. And, you know, there's, uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy as fierce as the grave. Um, you know, pausing there, just, we named this, the title of this one was the, um, you know, love yeah. is not meaningless. Uh, when we look at the Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs here, there is a love that endures beyond the grave. We would talk about this is the love of Jesus Christ yeah. for his bride, the church, which will last forever and is not meaningless. Uh, so the love that we should pursue and look for is the love that Jesus gives. Yeah. Well, it's you know, the, the first Corinthians where the, you know, love never fails. Yeah. You know, because like, love endures forever. Right. And that love is, you know, not just some basic emotion. It is the giving of God yeah. to his people. And that will never die. So true um, love is um, self, is self-sacrificial or whatever yeah. it's not selfish it's the opposite of selfish <laughs> right selfless selfless yeah um yeah so you know i love that set me as a seal upon your arm right you can this this uh a seal is kind of a signet ring it's a mark so the, set me as a mark upon your arm you can see this with jesus it's like a brand yeah jesus has been branded with us um yeah and jealousy is fierce of the grave we talk about here love you know is a powerful fire here it's flashes or flashes of fire the very flame of the lord Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he'd be utterly despised. So it'd be kind of like, I'll give you my all my money if you'll love me, kind of thing. You can't buy love, yeah. is kind of what he's getting at okay. there. Um, you can't 
buy something that just kind of is a gift from God. It's kind of like um, Simon the Magician there in Acts chapter oh, 8 Oh, where and he nine, tries to buy the... The gift of God with money. Yeah. And, you know, Peter looks at him and says, you die with your money, right? Because you can't buy the gift of God with money. Um, same kind of here. You can't buy God's gift of love with money. It's just... And you, you, people talk this way. They fall in love. It, it's not like they went out and were like looking to love somebody. It just kind of happens. happens to them. Same thing with love. So love is a gift that's given by God. It just happens. Um, so you can't get money for it, which is then great because the final advice at the end of the book is, I had all this vineyard and possessions and I tried to sell them for love, but I was kind of uh, mocked for doing it, which is kind of the, the, here's an example of you trying to buy money. And it's actually Solomon trying to buy somebody with all of his money mm -hmm. and he gets rejected. Um, <laughs> which is kind of a funny thing. Um, yeah, was it... Uh, Solomon had a vineyard, this verse 11, at Baal Haman. He let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is before me. You, O Solomon, may have the thousand, and the keepers of the fruit, two hundred. So he's kind of like rejecting Solomon's offer to buy what belongs at his vineyard, his bride. Um, so it's kind of like Solomon coming and saying, hey, I have all this money, I'll buy yours. He's like, no, you keep all your stuff. I'll keep mine, because I love what's mine. Um, here, so I kind of love it. So Solomon here gets turned down, um, <laughs> which is good because he's a guy who it seems like he was never turned down yeah. uh, with his, what, 300 wives and 700 concubines, Something I think like it is. That, yeah. So, yeah, so here he gets rejected. Um, yeah, so fun. Well, good. Is there anything else that, there's a, that finally ends with um, he, you know, he's joined his companions. He's look, listening to see if he'll hear his bride's voice. He's waiting to hear it. Um, and she's looking to see if he's coming. Uh, so there's kind of like this mutual, they're lost again, and they're searching for it. And that's how the book ends, is they're on the, they're on the hunt for each other again. Um, and just like that, it, has, it ends. So, um, speaking of Solomon, I know some people have issues with this book having been written by Solomon because he has 300 yeah. wives and 700 concubines. <laughs> right. And so it's like, what does he know about love? does he know about love? Um, um, is that one of those... Do as I say, not as I do, sort of situations. Probably. Because, um, yeah. I mean, this comes from, ultimately comes from God, not Solomon. Right. Yeah, Solomon's just the mouthpiece for God yeah. that he uses. Because, I mean, we could also say that about, like, <clears throat> Proverbs and stuff, too, because Solomon ended up not, not being so, so wise. wise. Yeah. Um, doesn't mean what he said was wrong. He just failed to live it out. Right. Yeah, right. He is. He failed to take his own advice. He's, he is a, a sign and a prototype of Christ, but he himself is not. All right, so we'll see little flashes of like, oh, that's very Jesus-like. But like, oh, that part is not Jesus-like. Um, yeah, so you, you can come across that here in the book too. So good. You know, and that kind of says something here. The book ends with this kind of searching and longing to. One has to wonder if, you know, when Jesus comes back, there is this final fulfilling, but there's still the desire and the pursuit for one another. Uh, it's kind of like how people will say after you get married, you don't stop with, uh, you know, the romance. You keep it up. Well, even after here at the final consummation, at the end of all things, when Jesus comes back and unites us to himself, there'll still be this longing and this desire that will now continue to happen for all eternity. It's almost like not being, not that we're separated and anxious, but now there's kind of the continuous like longing for each other that will happen. It's not like we're going to get bored being... Yeah, there'll be yeah. a desire. Something that marriage right now partially fulfills, um, but something that it's going to be fulfilled with when Jesus comes back. So marriage is but a sign of what will be at the end of all things. So, and it's kind of like how uh, my family always jokes that my grandparents are still on their honeymoon, kind yeah. of. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you say that. Yeah, they just have that continuous love for each other. Yeah. Um, and the, the, the love that keeps happening, the desire for it. Yeah, so in a new age to come, marriage will be how life is lived for all of yeah. us. Uh, a full, true marriage. Or I suppose it's like the old man who still calls his wife his bride. Yeah, yeah. I can see, you can see that too. So, yeah. So wonderful. So anything else that kind of sticks out to you about Song of Songs? Or anything else about our topics here today? I think that's probably pretty good right now. Right. So we're done with the wisdom literature. Yeah. Now, like which, you said, proper, the prophets are sort of wisdom literature-esque. Right. But we're getting, Poetry. The, we're getting into the prophets. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have one of the prophets. They're their own cup yeah, of tea here. Yeah, that's going to be fun. Um, so yeah, I know, to condense them. Right, so you and I know we, both of us have talked about how are we going to talk about the prophets because yeah. they are a challenge. You either have Isaiah, which we're going to try to talk about in one week, which is like 60, 66 chapters. Yeah, 
and then you have the really short like one or two chapter ones that we have like five of them in a week so you know, that'll be yeah fun. But, the prophets are their own breed they really yes. are so we'll, we'll have fun. i mean we'll dig through as much as we can we'll point out some stuff i mean there's always too much we can yes. i mean i took a whole class that just focused on like three four chapters of isaiah yeah. um so yes. again some other resources kfuo does like yeah. thy strong word um the word of the lord endures forever that pastor will Whedon does um he's doing first john right now yeah it's been really um, fun listening to that one and yeah, so those are a couple of good resources. I mean, even if people want to borrow your blue commentaries, yeah, good stuff. really dig into them. There's a few books in the church library about certain, a few of the commentaries on some of the books. Yeah. Um, there might be one on Isaiah. I think Reading Isaiah with Luther. That's is a good one. one. I yeah, think I, that had, one's I a, had those too. I think that one's in the library. So, um, yeah. But next week we're actually doing First Timothy. Right. Which I forgot about because yeah. I was thinking we were doing Isaiah, but it's First Timothy next week. Yeah, so we'll week. talk about pastoral epistles, which yes. will be fun. So we'll dig into a lot of good topics. Then we're almost done with Timothy. Paul. Yeah, because they only have, what, four, first, second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon for him. Yeah. So, nine, we've done nine of his letters, so we only have four left. So, that'll be good, too. So, that's all coming up, prophets and yes. apostles, and uh, we'll dig in furthermore. So, say a word of prayer, then? Yes. All right, let's pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that because of your son, Jesus, there is something new under the sun, that life is not vain, and that you have revealed it to us and given it to us. Lord, in the Song of Songs, we see how you're, you pursue us. You chase after us. Lord, you search for your lost sheep. You search for your lost coin. Continue to search for us, to find us, to delight in us, that we might delight in you. Lord, the day is coming, coming soon, when you will return, when you will sit in judgment over all deeds that have been done, when you will consummate with your creation all that you have made and bring us into a life that is full and joyous, and with pleasures that will be forevermore, because it is through your Son, Jesus Christ, that they will be given. In his name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.